In this video, I'll be introducing the Durham cohomology. Let's start off with some prerequisites. If I have a smooth function f from a manifold M into a smooth manifold N, so these are both smooth manifolds, this is a smooth function, then I define the differential of f to be from Tm into Tn, the tangent space on n, m into the tangent space on n, where we send the derivation or vector field from Tm to the um, new tensor field dfx. And now, of course, a tensor field acts on a function f that brings you from n down to r. So what we could do is instead look at x applied onto a function from m to r, which is, in this diagram, a very easy example, is just doing little f and then big F. Now another interesting concept is using tensors. So if I have some um, k tensor on, t p, on tf of p, n, so this is in this at a specific point, so it's just a normal tensor, not a tensor field, then I can go ahead and define what is known as df star at a point p of alpha, which will be an element of tpm. So this is going to be some tensor at the point p in tm. So then we define this as df star at p of alpha applied to the vectors v1 to vn is going to be equal to alpha of df at p of v1 all the way up until df p of vn. Sorry, that should be vk and vk. So basically what this is doing is it's moving a tensor from here to a tensor in there. It's pulling it back. Okay, well then we can now define this for tensor fields. I say F star of a tensor field A in Tn at a point P is going to be equal to DF star at the point P of A at the point F of P. So we take our tensor field, apply it at a point, and then do DF star at that point. These are the fundamental starting points we have. Okay, well then, now we're going to move on to a different topic, which is alternating tensors. So we say alpha is a, a tensor is alternating. This is for any tensor on any vector field. It does not have to be related to manifolds. A tensor is going to be alternating if when I switch two of their inputs, input vectors, uh, I switch the sign. So alpha of v1 to vi and to vj and then to vn. Like that is going to be equal to negative alpha of v1 to vj to vi to vn. Switch to the indices, get a minus sign. Okay, cool. Now, if I take any tensor, it doesn't have to be alternating, I can create an alternating tensor out of it. So now, alternating of alpha is going to be defined on v1 to Vn, it's going to have a sort of weird definition. It's going to be 1 over n factorial, this is so that it has nice properties, times the sum for sigma in Sn. So this is the symmetric group on n letters. It's all of the permutations on n letters. And then it's going to be of the sine of the permutation times alpha of V sigma of 1 to v sigma of n. So what I do is for each permutation, I take the sine of the permutation, multiply that with alpha, and then I switch the vectors up according to that permutation. And then I multiply it by 1 over n factorial, so it's nice. So you can prove that this is in fact an alternating tensor, and that, that if this alpha is alternating, then the alternating form of it is just the tensor itself. So the alt of an alternating tensor is just that tensor. Now what we can do is we can define a um, set called lambda k on our vector space v, which is the set of alternating k tensors. 
what we're going to do is then define uh, what is known as a wedge product. If I have alpha in lambda k of v, and I have beta in lambda l of v, so these are two different values, they could be the same, I define their wedge product, alpha wedge product beta, to be k, fac k plus l factorial, k, l, k plus l factorial, divided by k factorial, l factorial, and then multiply this by the alternating form of alpha tensor product beta. So basically, this is a tensor product, but for alternating tensors. And uh, this term out front is like this, and that it just makes it nice. And it, ha it gives you nice properties, which I'm not going to go into right now. The example is lambda k of TPM for a manifold M. This has uh, very nice properties, but we're not going to go into that right now. So what if I remove that P, and I'll make it just of TM, and it's going to be the disjoint union of all the lambda k's of TP. M, like this. So TPM is the vector space, lambda k is the set of all alternating tensors on that vector space. So now what I can do is from this I can project it down to the manifold. Using the fact that this is a disjoint union, I send each tensor to their base point. And then, this is the important part, I can take a smooth section of it, omega. So we have that pi composed omega is the identity on m. So omega and then pi, we get the identity on m. We also have it that omega is smooth. So this is a smooth section of this projection. That, that rhymed. So now, let's take gamma of lambda k of tm, which is the set of all smooth sections. This is going to be what I'm going to call omega k of m, okay? Now, um, this specific set of all smooth sections is going to be the set of k forms. So omega is a k form, or k differential form. Omega is a differential form of order k. So a nice example is just of real numbers. So omega could be an element of like this. So it's going to be a k differential form on R n. For these differential forms and even just general differential forms, you have it that omega is going to be equal to omega i1 to i k of times dx i wedge product all the way up until dx i k. So basically it's going to be this function multiplied by dx's, which is just um, this, except x here is going to be the standard chart on R. So these are the standard charts on R, N, Rn, of course. So now what we can do is we can define what is known as the exterior derivative on omega, which is going to give you a k plus 1 form. And then we define this as being the differential of omega i1 to i k, so the differential of this function, wedge product dx i1, wedge product up until dx i k. So this is going to be a function brought up to this new one form, wedge product, this k form, giving us a k plus 1 form. So now this is what is known as the exterior derivative, as I said. And it's a map that's from k, m, into k plus 1, m. And this is for manifolds m, and we'll define it for manifolds m, but right now we only have it on r, n. So let's go ahead and um, look at some of the properties and see if we can extend it. This d taking you from lambda k of Rn into lambda k plus 1 of Rn is the exterior derivative and it has the following properties. It's linear. It also has the property that um, for omega in lambda k 
Rn and eta in lambda 1. No, not lambda. Omega. Omega. Sorry, I've been saying lambda, but it's omega. Omega 1 of Rn. So this is a k form, this is a 1 form. Then the exterior derivative of omega wedge product eta is going to be equal to the exterior derivative of omega wedge product eta and then plus negative 1 to the k from here of omega wedge product the exterior derivative of eta. Very simple. Now 3 is going to be that decomposed itself is the trivial map. Now if I have an omega, an element of this, uh, omega a k form, and f a function, a smooth function between two open sets of Rn, then f star, the pullback, of d omega is going to be equal to d applied to f star omega. Now this is a strictly um, real number thing. So these are all the properties. I'm not going to prove any of them, but just you're going to have to trust me. This is all true for Rn. But what I can do is I can replace Rn with any manifold. Except for this last one, where I have to do it in a different form. So this last one is going to be in the form of, if f is an element, is a zero form, which is just a smooth function down to r, then df, the exterior derivative of f, is just the differential. So it's just the differential, um, or the push forward, as we discussed before. These conditions actually determine a unique map d. So this map d, if it satisfies all of these, it's actually unique. And it's actually given in the form a uh, local form, that is, where if I'm given a chart u phi, it's given the form d omega equals phi star applied to d of phi inverse star omega. So now phi inverse star omega will give you a differential form on Rn, which will then, we can use the definition on Rn to do, and then we can do phi star to bring it back to m, so that we get a k plus 1 form on m. This um, definition relies on the definition on the real numbers, and it is the unique map that set aside these four conditions. So now here is the part where we get to the Durham cohomology. Start off with the trivial space, and we take it via um, the trivial map, but I'm just going to call it d for now. Uh, because it'll make sense once you see it. And then omega 0 of m, which is the c infinity of m, but we're not going to worry about that. And then take it via the exterior derivative to omega 1 of m. And then take it via the exterior derivative omega 2 of m. And then via the exterior derivative to omega 3 of m. And then we get this chain of... Um, this d, which is linear, between all of these. And this is what is known as a cochain complex. And what we do is that the standard homology or cohomology on this is going to be defined by hn equals the kernel of d, which is going to be from omega n on m into omega n plus 1 on m. Uh, quotient out the image of d from omega n minus 1 on m into omega n of m. Now we don't just call it hn, we call it hn, we put a little dr at the bottom here so you know it's Durham, and we put it uh, of m. So for each m we get the Durham cohomology. I'm not going to discuss any of its properties. I just wanted to go through all of the reasoning until we defined it. Because <sighs> that's the point of this new series where I just go introduce hard topics using some minimal-esque um, uh, knowledge on the material. 
I was asked this on my Ask Me Math stream, and I just wanted to introduce it well here. So, this is how you do it. And that's it. Thank you.